Let us pray. God most holy, look with mercy on this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, be given over into the hands of the wicked, and suffer death upon the cross. Keep us always faithful to him, our only Savior, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man and his form marred beyond human likeness, so will he sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed." We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet... It was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
Please stand for the gospel. A reading from the 19th chapter of John. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, They divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Gospel of the Lord.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters, in Christ the Crucified. The last few weeks during the evening, I've been reading a biography of one of the great literary writers of the 20th century, Russian author Andrew Solzhenitsyn. In his youth, he discovered communism and lost his Christianity. He served bravely in the Russian army fighting Hitler only to be accused of treason against Joseph Stalin. Sentenced to a Russian gulag, a labor camp for eight years, he rediscovered his Christianity in a veritable hell on earth. He found the joy of life in a place where men go to die. He learned all about materialism and greed only when he was, had everything taken away. And when he was finally banished from the Soviet Union, his homeland, he took refuge here in the United States in Vermont and was stunned to find many progressive minds that were very pro-Soviet back here in the 1970s. Andrew Solzhenitsyn is a Nobel Prize winning author and he wins the prize for life's paradoxes. Paradox can be the key to a great plot. William Shakespeare knew it. His character Juliet fell in love with a member of a, a hated family, her Romeo. And here was Juliet's take on it. My only love sprung from my only hate. Too early seen unknown and known too late. Prodigious birth of love it is to me that I must love a loathed enemy. If paradox can be the mark of a man's life or the key to an immortal plot, how much more so are pictures of paradox the very reason that we have come together today as we discover that our Lord Jesus himself is the poster child of paradox. A marvelous hymn written by author Sylvia Dunstan explores just a few of the paradoxes that we find in Christ. You, Lord, are both lamb and shepherd. You, Lord, are both prince and slave. You, peacemaker and sword bringer of the way you took and gave. You, the everlasting instant. You, whom we both scorn and crave. This Good Friday afternoon, we see that the ultimate paradox is not to be found in a Soviet gulag or in a Shakespeare plot, but on a hill called Golgotha. Carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. We know this section of scripture so well that, that the paradox of place is almost lost to us. I wonder how different it would be if, if just for a moment we read these words and they actually said, carrying his own cross, Jesus went out to the place of Birkenau, which is called Auschwitz. Maybe that would get our attention just a bit. Here's the point. What in the world is the Lord of life doing at the place of the skull? Only one thing happened at the place of the skull. Men died. What is Jesus the Lord of life, 
journeying there for. It's stunning. What else is interesting to me this afternoon is that we don't seem to have an issue with all the other places we find Jesus at. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay, isn't he lovely? The 12 year old Jesus in the temple courts learning the word and asking questions, my what a fine young lad he is. Jesus walking across the water to reach his disciples, simply stunning. Jesus shining with the glory of God on the top of Mount Transfiguration. It's good, Lord, to be here. But the place of the skull, Jesus, don't go there. Bad, bad things happen at the place of the skull. Think of all the places where you want Jesus to be in your life. God is your co-pilot. How thankful we are to have him in our passenger seat. We want Jesus standing right there at the side of the operating table, steady in the hands of that surgeon. We want the Lord Jesus to be under the roofs of our homes and in the walls of our classrooms and standing behind our preacher and our pulpit and, and under the domes of our houses of law and Congress. We want him there. But the place of the skull, anywhere but there. Perhaps we can explore this paradox best by stating it this way. Where is the last place on earth, brothers and sisters, that you want to be right now? I have ministered to veterans and POWs who have told me they never want to see another foxhole or another rung of barbed wire. I have ministered to people who were terribly abused as children and never ever want to go back to their childhood home, which was the little house of their horror. Or think about those other fears in life, rational or irrational, the more spiders there are in the basement, the less likely I am to go down there, and if there's a snake in that pit, I'm not climbing down. But here's the point. Abused and brutalized, Christ Jesus felt every sting, fang, and bite of this fallen creation. He met our every dreaded place at the place of the skull. That very place, which is the last place on earth that we would expect to find him is right where we needed him to be. There is a powerful paradox to the place. But there are also plenty of paradoxes on Good Friday when it comes to pictures of the various people. I, I think of Pontius Pilate. It, it was not a day that was going well for Pilate. He was woken up at dawn's first light with a lynch mob forming outside of his window. They had a crucifixion on their mind. He, he thought he would give them what they wanted when he, he offered them a, a real criminal to be punished and, and then an innocent man could go free. But the crowd chose poorly and Barabbas walked and now Pilate was trapped. He'd give Jesus a good old-fashioned Roman flogging in an effort to try and satiate their bloodlust just a bit, but as it turns out, 40 lashes minus one was not equal to the hate the mass of humanity had for this Jesus. He stands before you, and he sure isn't saying much. 
He has a little bit to say about a kingdom that isn't of this world and being on the side of truth or not, but, but you don't have time to debate the finer points of philosophical truth. You've got an issue on your hand, the matter is treason, and there's a riot beginning to brew. And so Pilate gets that bowl of water and does his best to wash his hand of the whole sordid affair. And then he has that sign written and tacked up there upon the cross as a thumb in the eye of the Jewish leadership. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And right there is a mighty big paradox. Pilate, who had no interest in the truth, turned out being a better theologian than the religious leaders of Judea. Every single syllable of that sign is God's truth. Jesus. Translation, the Lord saves. He does what only God can do because he is true God. Of Nazareth, born of the Virgin Mary as true man here in time and space to deliver us from the curse of the law here in time and space. King of the Jews. Love him or leave him, it matters not. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And one day soon, Pilate and Israel's priests were desperately, will desperately hope that they had listened to the syllables on that sign. There are, of course, more paradoxes of people. Jesus, who owns the earth, is crucified with criminals. He commands legions of heaven's angels, but is handed over to a Roman death squad. He yearns to cloak those Roman soldiers in bright heavenly white, but they're content to throw dice for his clothes. He's Mary's boy and Mary's God. He's ridiculed about being a king, yet he is king of kings. He is rejected by Israel's priests, yet he is the high priest. He is taunted with the thought that maybe, just maybe, Elijah might come and rescue him, but he is the Elijah who was to come, the prophet par excellence. But all of these paradoxes of place and of person lead to the greatest paradox of all, purpose. When Jesus had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Every single second of human history, every single syllable of Holy Scripture was all pointing forward to that one single word, it is finished. One single word in the Greek language, tetelestai, which is the precise word that Greek shopkeepers would write on the bottom of your bill of sale, paid in full. What a picture. Our sin, a hopeless debt. Not a thing we can do to pray, pay, obey, think or say away a single sin, let alone a lifetime of sin. But with that sacrifice on the cross, the debt is paid. No little balance remaining, paid in full. 
No 12 easy payment options paid in full. The Son of God who cannot lie says your debt of sin is squared away. But it's right there that we discover the paradox of purpose. It is true that Jesus has finished his work of salvation, but how often is it not also true that you and I are convinced that his work isn't quite finished? Not really finished, not fully for, for finished, maybe finished, but, but not for me, not, not right now. A dear old lady is lying on her hospital bed in a nursing home. She is a lifelong Roman Catholic and her Lutheran son is sitting next to her bedside and, and proclaims to her that Jesus has died to take away the sin of the world, but she can't quite get her mind around that fact. All sin? Really? Her priest had never told her that. Adding our doubts to Jesus' forgiveness makes Jesus' forgiveness less than finished. A dear Christian sister sits in my office and the tears are flowing. Her daughter has just taken a great big walk away from the Christian faith, and she feels terrible, really terrible. And as it turns out, she's really good at feeling terrible. In the hopes, of course, that her tears might make Jesus work, really work for her daughter. Adding our feelings to Jesus' work makes Jesus' work a little less certain, a little less than finished. I'm in a room with an alcoholic gentleman at a treatment facility. He is crying tears of guilt and remorse for the pain that his addiction has caused his family. I reassure him with the gracious love of the Lord Jesus Christ who died to take away that sin, and he doesn't say a syllable but immediately goes and begins talking about second chances and doing better next time. Sadly, adding our well-meant intentions and resolutions to Jesus' work makes Jesus' work a little less certain, a little less finished. Finally, I'm on the front step of a gentleman in Little Rock, Arkansas, and he tells me that he too believes in Jesus and that all a guy needs to do is, is invite Jesus into his life to become king of his heart. Sadly, even giving your heart to Jesus and resting your confidence in your faith in Jesus makes Jesus' work a little less certain. Together this afternoon, brothers and sisters, may the Lord bless us with the wisdom we need and the strength we lack to take every thought, every word, every deed, everything that would make Jesus' work a little less certain, a little less finished, and take it to a Golgotha near you for a quick and speedy end. Because it is finished. The gates of Satan's gulag have been opened. Brothers and sisters, never ever return to the burden of the guilt that once weighed you down. He is finished. You stand forgiven. You are free. You have been released from the barbed wire of a POW camp of sin. Don't even think of going back behind that barbed wire once again because today you stand forgiven. It is finished. 
and you are free. Jesus has thrown open the gates of your Auschwitz. Don't even think for a second of returning to that ugly mass grave of your fear of death because you stand forgiven and alive in the Lord Jesus who died that you might live. My encouragement to you this Good Friday is to rest your heart, your mind, your soul, and those of your children and your grandchildren in the saving pictures of paradox today. That at the place of the skull, the Lord of life died that you might live. That the criminal on the middle cross dying is the Lord of creation redeeming. And that the Son of God's tomb is a womb of new life for you. And if you ever doubt those paradoxes, drop everything and don't walk, but you run to three words and you hang on and you never, ever let go. It is finished. And then go out to the grave and wait till Sunday. Because as you will soon see, Jesus isn't finished yet. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess the faith. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. Just one announcement this afternoon regarding our schedule of services. Our service this evening is a service of darkness, seven devotions by seven different pastors based on the seven words of the cross. And then tomorrow evening's service, the Easter Vigil or Easter Eve service, please note carefully the time of that service, it will begin precisely at sundown, 7.12 p.m. At this time, I'd kindly ask that all of you take a moment with the friendship registers and the pews as we gather our gifts of love to the Lord.
Please stand for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church, that our gracious Father would defend her from the devil and keep her faithful to her Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, you have revealed your saving name to the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Protect us from the assaults of the evil one and help us remain faithful to your word so that in every adversity we may stand firm in our faith and give ourselves fully to our Savior's work. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in the public ministry and for all the people of God. Almighty and everlasting God, you rule over all things for the good of your people. Preserve us from divisive spirits and false teachers. Give your servants the grace to proclaim Christ joyfully in word and deed, so that all who hear them may come to know their Savior better and be strengthened for their lives of service. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who are being instructed in the word, that they may remain firm in the simple faith of baptism. Almighty and everlasting God, you make us your own dear children by the washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit. Give strength to all who are buried with Christ in baptism, that each day they may die to sin and rise again to live new and holy lives. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our earthly government, our rulers, and all who are in authority. Almighty and everlasting God, you have established earthly government to keep a measure of order in this dying world and to protect us from the disorder of sin. Give to all rulers the wisdom to govern well and to all citizens the desire to obey them so that we may live peaceful lives in all godliness and holiness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray that our gracious Father would protect us and our communities from the many earthly calamities that threaten us. Almighty and everlasting God, on all sides, we are surrounded by danger from wars and famine, from disease and pestilence, with the devil begrudging us every minute of our lives. Protect us from all these miseries so that your name may still be glorified in them and so that we may safely pass through them to your heavenly kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who are outside of the church, that they may come to know the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, your Son was lifted up on the cross so that he might draw all people to himself. Through the proclamation of your word, 
mercifully gather from the nations a people that are your very own, that we may join together around your throne in glory to praise and thank you forever. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies and for all those who hate us. Almighty and everlasting God, no one can harm us without grieving you, whose name we bear. We ask that you would change the hearts of those who work against us and who hate us without reason. Give them repentance and faith so that they may be, so that they may be glad with us and find joy in your love. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer under cross and trial. Almighty and everlasting God, you sent your Son into the world to bear our grief and to carry our sorrows. Help those who are suffering for your name's sake and who are struggling against temptation, that they may not be overwhelmed with sadness, but find relief in your grace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask, in the words he himself has taught us. Our, Our Father, Father in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. O come, let us worship him.
We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. By your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. 